Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, and thank you also for the Genetic Society for awarding this uh, to me. It's a great honor and, and privilege. What I'd like to do uh, to begin today is for you to imagine you're a Martian and you've landed on Earth and you're trying to make sense of the things that humans make and the way they use them. And you go around looking at various objects and you see uh, everything seems to have adapted or optimized for its particular function. So you see snowmobiles have skis on them to help them go through the snow. Cars have wheels to go on roads. Uh, boats have hulls to make them skim over the water. So everything seems to be suited to its environment. So that's the sort of uh, first take-home lesson that you come up with. But as you start investigating a bit more carefully uh, human activities, you find that not everything fits into this idea. So one day you're in Norwich, which is, uh, as you heard, which is where I work, and um, you decide to be teleport, teleport yourself over to China. So you go to, to Beijing. And in Beijing, you notice something very strange, that in Norwich they drive on the left, whereas in Beijing they drive on the right. So what's that got to do with adaptation to local conditions? There's nothing obvious in environmentally that about the difference between Norwich and, and Beijing that leads you to drive one way or the other. And you start to notice that there's some other things that have the same bizarre characteristic. For example, in Norwich, you'll see that the road signs, uh, for example, the school sign, have a white background with a red border. And the same signs in Beijing have a yellow background with a black border. And again, this has nothing to do, obviously, with the climate or environment in these two different places. Something else is going on. So you scratch your head and you decide to investigate these things a bit further. And you start to map out the distribution of these different characteristics. Okay, so you find that, for example, driving on the left and driving on the right has very strict geographical borders. There are very strict boundaries as to who, which countries drive on which side of the road. And you find the same is true of road signs. Okay, so you find that with road signs, some countries have white backgrounds with red borders, some have yellow backgrounds with red borders, some have diamonds, and so forth. So rather than um, obviously this being explained by adaptation to local conditions, it's telling us something else about humans. It's telling us something that maybe is to do with history, that maybe these distributions have something to do with history, maybe they have to do with territoriality, maybe there's something else that's guiding uh, this behavior pattern. And this same notion, uh, and we're dealing often with equivalent solutions to the same problem rather than an optimization to a single solution. The same sort of issue was touched on by another traveler, uh, another famous traveler, not a Martian this time, but another fictional traveler, uh, Lemuel Gulliver. So in Gulliver's travels, when he's swept, sort of shipwrecked, and lands on this island of Lilliput where there are small people, what he finds is that the these people are at war with a neighboring island, and they're at war over which end of the egg you should crack to, to open an egg. So there are the big Indians that believe that you should crack your egg at the big end, and the little Indians that believe you should crack the egg at the little end. And, and these two countries are at war over this issue, um, each believing that their way of cracking the egg has to be the superior way of doing the job. And Jonathan Swift, um, I think, is alluding to the fact that we, are, even when we're presented with a, a situation where there are two equally good solutions, where there's nothing to choose between them, we're so obsessed with our own way of doing things and often believing that the way we do things are the best ways that you can uh, be at war over such a uh, trivial issue. Now, when we look at biology and organisms, we're rather like Martians trying to make sense of organisms. For example, when we look at the variety of forms we see around, the first thing that strikes us is adaptation to local conditions. We see a frog and a lily, both adapted, a water lily, both adapted to an aquatic environment. We see a bear, polar bear, and a pine tree adapted to uh, 
a wintry environment, uh, a cheetah and grass to the climate of the savannah. So that's what strikes us first, the adaptation to the environment. And um, we explain that these days with Darwin's theory of natural selection, that over many generations, organisms tend to become better adapted to their environment. And there's the, tempt, uh, the temptation to conclude that therefore evolution is all about optimization, finding the best solution to uh, surviving and reproducing in a given environment. But when we think about that, it doesn't quite, quite add up, because why is it then, if, if evolution is all about optimization, why is it that given a particular environment, we should find one organism, the one that's ideally optimized for that environment? Why do we find many organisms in an environment rather than just one, the optimal organism, if evolution is all about optimization? And there's another problem. Why doesn't evolution come to a halt? All right. So if everything's about optimization, shouldn't organisms get better and better? And then at some point, they'll reach the optimum, and then evolution should stop, Okay, because then everything's perfectly adapted to its environment. So this notion of optimization causes us some problems. And these are not new problems. These have been thought about many, over many years, going way back to Darwin, this, the, these types of issues. But what has changed recently is that we have new methods for addressing these types of problems. And one of the most important methods that has now come about uh, that we can use is uh, what's called genomics, DNA sequencing. We can now obtain the entire genetic code or makeup of organisms very, very quickly. And these genetic codes are in the form of a series of letters, that, that, uh, the DNA code, you, and there are four letters in this DNA code, A, G, C, and T, and they're arranged in a sequence along the chromosome, along the DNA molecules. And uh, say a human genome, for example, has about three billion of these letters arranged one after the other. And that sequence of those four letters essentially carries the hereditary information um, that determines our various characteristics. Moreover, and we can sequence, obtain sequences like this now in a matter of hours, Okay, this was inconceivable uh, a few years ago, even a few years ago, that we can now so rapidly obtain this DNA sequence information. And it means we can also compare different individuals and look at variation, what's causing the variation uh, between individuals. But this technology has also created a problem for us because we now have this vast amount of DNA, all this information, all these sequences, and we're scratching our heads trying to figure out what it all means, because these sequences, to most of you sitting in this room, will not mean very much. And the same is true to biologists. We're trying to figure out what all of this information is telling us. And in fact, much of biology these days is to do with um, understanding or relating these sequences to the actual uh, appearance and uh, properties of organisms. So what I want to do today is to tell you about some insights using these methods we've been able to get into these um, old problems of evolution. And the organism that I'm going to tell you about uh, today is uh, the snapdragon, the antirhinum. Now, I've worked on snapdragons uh, since I moved to Norwich, which was 33 years ago. So for 33 years, I've worked on snapdragons. Um, and some people might think, what a sad life you've led. <laughs> um, and you wouldn't be alone, OK? Because, uh, in fact, I was at a party a few weeks ago, and I was talking to somebody, and she was telling me how much she enjoyed her job. You know, she said she loves surfing the internet, um, you know, finding new clients, going and meeting them in Dubai, making the deals. You know, she's, she said, you know, it's just so exciting what she does. So I said well, you're very lucky to have found a job that you enjoy. And she said, luck has nothing to do with it. She said, I work very hard. I work sometimes in the early hours of the morning doing, you know, f surfing the web, finding, finding my clients. And then she turned to me and she said, so what do you do? <laughs> so, so I said, well, I work on these snapdragons, you know, <laughs> uh, trying to understand the principles of genes and how they control uh, the shape and, and the, the color of the flowers and how, how that works, you know, what are the fundamental principles? And so she said, um, what's that f but what's that for? So I said, well, um, have you ever thought, you know, you put a seed into the ground and it turns, miraculously, it turns itself into a plant with flowers and leaves of particular shapes and forms. 
And nobody's telling the plant how to do that. It does that all on its own, without any help from the outside, except a bit of uh, water and sunshine. How does that happen? You know, what are the principles involved? We still don't understand that. And we, we're studying that and the genes, the, how genes uh, influence that process. So she looked at me and she said, um, yes, but what's it for? <laughs> so I said, um, so I noticed she had her daughter with her. So I said, look, weren't you amazed? You know, when you, when you were pregnant, you had this fertilized egg inside you. It grew on its own. It turned itself miraculously into this baby that was born with all these features, you know. And, and that all happened through genes acting. And how does that work? We don't understand many of the principles. And how, do, how does it evolve? Um, so she looked at me and she said, um, yes, but what's it for? <laughs> so then she noticed somebody else. Uh, uh, she found somebody else to, to go and talk to at this point, so I didn't... <laughs> so that was the end of my conversation. But it illustrates the fact that we're often so wrapped up in what we do, and we're so passionate about our own world in which we live, that sometimes it's difficult for others to kind of latch on to what, what, why we're so interested in, in these particular things. And that's true of whatever we do. So what I'm hoping I can do today is tell you a bit about why these snapdragons actually have something interesting to tell us, not just about biology, but maybe perhaps even about ourselves. Now, for many years, uh, when, I, when I started working in Norwich, for about the first 20 years or so, I studied particularly how genes in, in these plants control the, the formation of the flower and the shape and, the, and, and, uh, and its coloration. And we used this variegated snapdragon which has a particular property which had an advantage, which is the pieces of DNA can move around from one position to another position in its genome. So that was a very useful property. That's why you see these spots on the flower. They're due to pieces of DNA moving around from one position to another. So using that as a tool, we were able to find out a lot about how genes worked in this plant on, at, using our lab uh, and glasshouse material. But then um, about 18 years ago, a, uh, a colleague of mine, Christoph Tebow from the University of East Anglia, came over to see me and he said, you know, it's all very well studying these, uh, how genes work in the lab um, and using these uh, glasshouse varieties. What about figuring out what's going on in the wild? Like, how does this relate to what's going on in natural populations um, in, with wild snapdragons? And he said, you know, we really should go. Why don't you try and use that understanding, applying it to what's going on in natural populations? Well, he didn't have to twist my arm because it turns out that snapdragons in the wild grow in Spain and the Mediterranean and, and Italy, south of France. So, you know, I, I, I thought, yeah, great idea. Let's do that. So we, we set off on a journey to try... Uh, we did several trips to try and document and s explore the variation going on in nature and so that we could relate it to what we knew about how genes function. So, uh, and I'm going to tell you what, about one of these trips that we took, which was with, um, we were studying this plant, Antirhinum pseudomagus. It's a particular species of snapdragon. It has magenta flowers. And you can see the bee has landed on the flower. It's about to enter the flower. And you may be able to see just at the entry point is a yellow patch, which just signposts to the bee where the bee can enter, all right? So this particular type of uh, species grows um, in, in, in the Pyrenees and, the, and in Spain and in France. And we were on the road following its distribution. So I remember we were on this road, we were driving along. The great thing about snapdragons is you could see them from the, the car window, actually. So, you know, you didn't need to be, um, it wasn't epic voyages. You could just look outside and you could see them growing uh, in the fields. So you go along, you see, we saw these magenta snapdragons, we go along further along the road, magenta snapdragons, yes, that's fine, more magenta snapdragons, it's all looking good, very consistent, magenta snapdragons. And then we arrived at a particular corner, and I remember it very well, it was a particular corner in the road, and I couldn't believe it. I looked out of the window, and we saw a whole spectrum of different flower colours, a whole collection, there were yellows, there were whites, there were pinks, there were all sorts of different um, snapdragon flowers. And we carried on like this for about a mile. And then after about a mile, they started to turn mainly into yellow. So yellow snapdragons. So what's, what you're seeing here is what's known as a hybrid zone. That we have these two species 
of, of snapdragon or, 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 or subspecies of snapdragon. We have yellow ones on one side and one region, magenta flowered ones in the other, and where they meet, they form this amazing collection of hybrids. Now, although this was a complete surprise to me, it wasn't a complete surprise to Christoph, because what he didn't tell me was that we went, it wasn't by accident we were driving down this valley. Okay? <laughs> he'd gone, before we went on this trip, he'd gone to the Natural History Museum. And in the Natural History Museum, he'd come across this herbarium specimen. And on the label of this herbarium specimen, which was collected in 1928, 89 years ago, uh, it says, in French, this group displays a marvellous colour polymorphism on the left slope of the Ribas Valley. So that's exactly where we were. We were going along the slope, and that had been reported already in 1928. We just didn't, what we didn't know is that it was still happening then. So as a matter of interest, is anybody here born in 1928 or before? Anyone? Nobody? Sorry? Nobody's admitting to it. <laughs> Well, so you're all born. So you were all born after this event was was happening. All right. So everyone in this room is younger than these hybrid this hybrid zone, and it probably goes earlier than 1928. All right. So it goes way back. So it's been there a long, long time. These plants have been hybridizing and forming these color various colors. So so what's going on? Well, we to try and figure out the the right the sort of logic behind these different colors and why these different colors exist. Um, we've been documenting, visiting this area, and documenting and recording the plants over many years, all right, and taking their GPS coordinates. And what I'm going to do is going to take you on a sort of journey, a bit like the one I took, but a bit faster, through this uh, hybrid zone. We're going to start off at the magenta end, and you're going to see a bunch of pins. And each pin is a plant, and it's color-coded according to the flower on the, 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 the flowers it bore, all right? So we're going to start off then, hopefully. So you see, you didn't know genetics could be so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yes, it's a very dramatic, it is a very dramatic um, demonstration of these, of hybridization occurring in, oops, that's going to happen again, hold on. I need to, I need to do this manually. Okay, so um, we have this region in w where these hybrids are forming, um, uh, which has been happening over many, many years, and one of the questions we want to know is, why is it that we have, for example, yellows on one side, and magenta on the other. And the first thing that people will say is, well, that's because there's an environmental difference. Okay? It must be that where the yellow-flowered snapdragons are growing, there's a different environment than where the magenta-flowered ones are growing. Or maybe there's a different pollinator, maybe it's a different type of bee, or whatever. So we've looked very carefully. We can find no difference between the pollinators or the environment on the yellow side compared to the magenta side. So we don't think it's to do with an environmental difference. So, so what's going on? Well, a clue is given by looking a bit more carefully at the flowers. Okay, so it's not just the yellow and magenta. If you look a bit more carefully, what you see is that the yellow-flowered species, called Antirhinum striatum, has magenta, has magenta veins just above where the bee enters. I hope you can see that. And the magenta-flowered species has yellow highlight, yellow patch, just where the bee enters. So both of them are signposting the bee entry point. They're telling the bee, come in here if you want to collect nectar, but they're doing it in different ways. They're like two equivalent ways of signposting, saying you can either have a yellow background with a magenta highlight, or you have a magenta background with a yellow highlight. So, the, so, so we're dealing, as it were, with two different signposts that seem to be quite equivalent. The question is, why are they there and how are these signposts produced? So let's first think about how the signposts are actually generated. How do genes generate these patterns? Okay, so for that, um, I need, I'm going to do a demo. So no Royal Institutional Lecture is complete without a demo. So let me do that. Okay, so 
what are the ways that you can make a signpost? So we're going to make a signpost. So here's one way of making a signpost. Um, I'm going to make an arrow. So we can just do this. And spray an arrow. OK, that's, <coughs> that's one way of doing it. <laughs> um, but there's another way of making an arrow. For that, I need a volunteer. Now, I see there's a young man there. Would you like to come forwards? So you're going to make a much better arrow than I am. Than I have, I mean. So what's your name? William. William. Well, thanks for coming forward, William. Right, now, William, what I'd like you to do is take this and spray as much as you want over that. Go for it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, that's really good. That's excellent. Keep going, keep going. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's a fantastic job. Look at that. You've got it all covered. Yeah? Good. Thank you, William. Do you want, actually, do you want... Do you want to pull off, pull off that piece of paper now? Hey, look at that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, William. OK, so there's two ways you can make an arrow. One is by um, spraying. Uh, and the other way is through a sort of stencil. Okay, so one is a kind of a negative and one is a positive way. And both of these methods are used to pattern flowers, actually pattern genes in general. And I want to illustrate that first by considering the magenta color. So I want you to now, we're just going to concentrate on magenta. So forget the yellow, just think magenta. And what you can see on that flower is some veins just over the entry point of the bee. That's the vein pattern, the magenta pattern, that you see in Antirhinum striatum, the yellow one, normally. Now, if we change a gene or remove a gene called Eluta, what happens is those veins now get put all over the flower, all over the, all over the upper petals, at least. So Eluta is like a stencil. It's preventing, normally, the, 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 vein, the coloration spreading over the flower. If we remove the stencil, now we see that the uh, veins are everywhere. And if we now, there's another gene called rosea, which adds more pigment or generates more pigment in the flower. And if we've, in the absence of the stencil, if we now add rosea, we now generate the fully colored magenta flower. So it's a combination of stenciling and genes that promote color that are giving us this pattern. So how do these genes work? Well, they actually code for both rosea and eluta, code for proteins indicated by that sort of banana-shaped thing. Um, and these proteins bind to genes and switch those genes on or off. So the stencils switch the genes off, the, the other genes uh, switch the genes on. And those genes then produce RNA, which is a, a, a single-stranded version of DNA. And that RNA, which comes from the gene, then codes for a protein, and that carries out the pigment production, the pigment biosynthesis. That synthesizes the red pigment the magenta pigment in this case. So we have this combination of stenciling and spraying, but at the level of gene activity. Okay. So that's, that's magenta. Now, yellow is a slightly different story. So let's now just concentrate on yellow. Okay. So with Antirhinum pseudomagus, we have yellow just at the entry point of the flower. Now, if we, take, if we add, add a gene called Flavia, we get more yellow. We, we, it's like a, a yellow spray. But you'll see the yellow is still restricted. But now if we take a stencil gene away, a gene called sulfuria, then the yellow gets spread everywhere. Okay? So again, it's a combination of spraying and stenciling that gives us the colors. Let me tell you, how, does, how do these genes work, uh, Flavia and sulf, sulf? They don't quite work in the same way as the magenta genes. They work slightly differently. So in this case, Flavia codes for itself codes for the RNA that then leads to the production of a protein involved in pigment biosynthesis. So Flavia is a gene needed to make the yellow pigment. Sulfuria, we showed very recently, operates in a different way. The stencil gene 
That operates by generating small RNAs. These are small pieces of RNA. And what these RNAs do is they interfere, they bind to the RNA of Flavia because they're related to it, and essentially call, break, break down that RNA so that it can't make the pigment. So the stencil in this case is operating through what's called a small RNA that then uh, inhibits the activity of the biosynthetic gene. So we have four genes that are controlling the pigment as a whole, the yellow and the magenta together. So if we combine those together, we end up with this sort of picture. So, so we see that striatum has a combination of these four genes, which is low in magenta, but high in yellow. And so you end up with this magenta, restricted magenta highlight over the yellow flower. Whereas pseudomagus has the other combination. It has high magenta and highly restricted yellow, and that generates the yellow highlight on the magenta background, just through the action of these four different genes. And you can imagine other combinations. For example, if you had low magenta and low yellow, what you would end up with is a white flower with these very restricted spots of magenta and yellow. Alternatively, if you had combinations which had high magenta, the genes that gave high magenta and high yellow, you'd end up with an orange flower. So all these different kinds of combinations arise through the way you play around and combine your four genes. It's like you've got a palette, a palette of different colors. You're playing around with these colors to generate these uh, different types of flower. And that's exactly what's happening in our hybrid zone because we have our yellow species and our red species and where they meet, or magenta species, where they're meeting, the genes are getting mixed up. All right? And as the genes get mixed up, we generate this whole spectrum of different flower colors by the way these genes are getting combined together. But that still doesn't ask, answer the question, why is it that magenta is on one side and yellow is on the other, and how did this situation ever arise? So to answer that, um, we're going to turn to DNA sequencing because we're going to sequence the population of these yellows and magentas. But before doing that, I need to explain a bit about the principles of how you quantify variation or divergence between uh, species and, and populations. So I suppose you've got two populations here. These are going to be populations of dogs. Okay? So we take a sample from our first population, population one. We sample the dog, and it has this uh, appearance. We sample the dog from the other population, and it looks different. So we might conclude, ah, we're dealing with two very different populations here, two different types of dogs. So we then take another sample from population one. Oh, well, that's different from the first dog. So, OK, let's take another sample from population two. Well, that's different again. So we're getting variation within each of these populations. So we keep sampling okay, more dogs from each population, and we find, actually, the populations are the same. All right? that there isn't actually any difference between the populations because the variation within the population is exactly the same as the variation between the population. And that we call this uh, a relative divergence of zero. There is no diver there's, relatively speaking, there is no divergence between the populations because if I was to sample any two dogs from within the population, they're as likely to be different from each other as if I was to sample from one population and the other. Okay? So that's a relative divergence of zero. Now let's take another type of population. OK, we sample from the first population, we get this dog. Sample from the second population, we get that dog. We sample another dog. Ah, now that's quite similar to the first dog. Sample another dog. Yes, OK, we're getting a different pattern here. Right, in this case, the dogs are all identical within one population, but distinctive from the other population. And in this case, we say we have a relative divergence of one. Because now we know absolutely, just by sampling two dogs, which, which populations those are coming from. We have two dogs from the same population, be similar or almost identical, whereas dogs sampled from different populations will be different. So armed with that notion of relative divergence, we can apply it now to anything. We can apply it to, for example, to DNA sequences. Not dogs, and that's what I'm going to show you now. So what we did was we sampled these two populations, the yellow plants and the magenta plants, and we extracted their DNA and obtained the DNA sequence. So we compared the DNA sequence from lots of individuals from each population. And the sort of sample result we got for a small section of the DNA is shown here. So on the top, you can see uh, DNA sequences sampled from the magenta population. On the bottom, you're seeing samples from the yellow population. Wherever you see a dot 
That indicates the DNA sequence is identical. There's no difference in the letter at that position between the two populations. But there are three positions here where the sequence is varying, where the, DNA, where the letter varies either within or between the populations. If you look at the one on the right, you'll see that there's an equal mixture of A's and T's, that two, those are the two letters, but they're equally mixed in both populations. And so there we say that the relative divergence at that position is zero. If you look at the one on the left, you'll see that there's T's in one population and A's are in the other population. So for that base or letter, we say relative divergence is one. And we can have intermediate cases, like one, the one shown there, which has an intermediate level of divergence, which is varying in one population, but fixed in the other. So this is a very short stretch of DNA. Now we can do this, now we can go along an entire genome and ask, as we go along the genome, what is the relative divergence, the average relative divergence from my little piece from my sequence of DNA at any position? What I'm going to show you is the result for one chromosome. That's a long DNA molecule, which is about, in this case, about 50 million of these letters long. All right, so we're going to go along this 50 million sequence and ask, what is the relative divergence? If we do this, what we find, so this is plotting relative divergence along the vertical axis, and we're moving along the chromosome along the horizontal axis, and we see that the relative divergence is quite low. It's about below 0.1 for most of the chromosome, except for one place along the DNA where it goes, you see a sudden spike. All right, And that spike is at, towards the right end, and that spike turns out to be exactly where the genes for pigment color are located. All right? Uh, and the same is true, if I, in this case I'm, we're looking at the magenta color genes, the same would be true for the yellow, but they're just on a different chromosomes. So there's a little piece of the genome here that is very, uh, showing high relative divergence, whereas the rest of the genome is showing relatively low divergence. And these, this, this phenomenon is called, sometimes called genomic islands of divergence. That is, there are small sections of the DNA that show this very dramatic raised divergence. So why? What's going on? Why do, do we have this high relative divergence? So to explain that, um, I'm going to go back to schools. Uh, no, yeah, back to school science. Okay, so before the 1960s in the UK, there was a lot of different types of school sign because each local authority basically could, could decide which type of sign it used for its, uh, for its schools. And so this is a typical one. looks like something out of an Enid Blyton book with a girl swinging at her satchel, the boy carrying his books. So um, that's the type of sign you would have seen before the 1960s. But during the 1960s, the government set up a commission to standardize designs. And two designers, Jock Kinnear and Margaret Calvert, came up with a standard set of designs. So all of the designs you see on motorways, for example, are essentially their designs. All right? So these were all standardized in the 60s. And school signs were also standardized. So um, instead of these now, sadly, we now have this. And this is everywhere. Every, 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 wherever you go in the UK, you will find this is the sign for schools. It's, it's uniform. So what's happened here is you might say that this, this sign has swept through the entire population of the UK. It's been swept through to uniformity. And similar sweeps have happened in other countries. For example, in, in China, there would have been a sweep for uh, maybe the yellow, the sign with the yellow background all right, that I showed you earlier. And if different places are undergoing sweeps for different sign, sign, signages in this case, then you're going to end up with high relative divergence because you're going to end up with uniformity in each population but distinction between the populations. And that's part of the explanation of what's going on with our chromosomes. So the reason that you're seeing this spike is because particular variants of these genes, Rosier and Deluta in this case, have been swept through the population. But they haven't been swept through by a government edict. They've been swept through by natural selection. Natural selection, for some reason, has favoured particular variants in the yellow population and particular variants in the magenta population, and it's led to them being relatively uniform for these variants, so you end up with these two different colors and this high level of relative divergence. But the question is, why is it? Why is the, what about the rest of the chromosome? Why aren't we seeing this throughout the chromosome? Why only the color? Why do we only see this 
the color genes. So to explain that, um, I want to go to the other example that I showed you, uh, driving on the left and driving on the right. Now, it's clear that dry, if you have countries that are driving on the left and driving on the right and they meet, there's a potential problem, all right, if the roads uh, actually interact. And it's not a problem for the UK because there's this sea around us, and so we normally get off the boat or the train and just try and remember to drive on the other side of the road. We don't actually meet people coming at us, you know, driving on the other side of the road. But there are places where this can happen, uh, where there are countries where driving on the left, driving on the right, you can have roads where they meet. Okay, and one example, uh, <laughs> one example of this is Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, because it's an ex-UK British colony, they drive on the left. In mainland China, they drive on the right. So I want you to imagine what happens when, when roads from these two countries meet. All right? Well, it's not disastrous, you'll be pleased to hear. Because people come up with ideas as to how to deal with this problem. And here's the, here's the solution. <laughs> here's one solution. Um, that you basically have a road that switches you over, you see, avoids the problem. Great idea. Um, but it illustrates the fact that for certain types of cultural distinctions, there are inherent problems or incompatibilities when certain solutions meet. So both left and right driving are good solutions, equivalent solutions, but where they meet, we end up with a mixed solution which doesn't work very well, so we have to have some very clever way of dealing with it. But that's not true of all cultural differences. Okay, so let, for example, if you go to Norwich, you can go to Starbucks and you can have a nice coffee in Starbucks. Okay, now if you go to Beijing, you can go to Starbucks and have a nice coffee in Starbucks. All right, because Starbucks is pretty much the same in Beijing and Norwich. There's no problem, there's no incompatibility, all right, of the type of driving on the left and driving on the right with Starbucks because they can move freely without creating a problem. And that's kind of what's going on with our genome. All right? What's happening here is that, the, that most of the genes are behaving rather like Starbucks genes. Okay? So that they can freely move between our populations because there isn't a fundamental problem where, where, with hybrid combinations. But the genes of flower color, because they have to work in this specific combination, you saw the four had to work in a particular way to generate the color. When they mix, they create combinations that don't work well. And because of that, the selection acts against those combinations. And so we end up with a barrier to fl the flow of genes between the populations. So the colors are kept separate for the similar reason that driving on the left and driving on the right are kept separate. But many other genes can flow through uh, quite, quite easily. Now we can represent this idea of um, what, what may be going on with, the no with a notion called uh, an adaptive landscape. So with an adaptive landscape, uh, what you see is, we have, is a particular type of plot in which on the horizontal axis, we represent the possible, or the horizontal plane, we imagine all possible genetic makeups, all, right? all the genetic combinations, different gene combinations you can imagine. The vertical axis is the fitness or the reproductive success of particular genetic combinations. And you're seeing here two peaks. That means there are two genetic combinations that are giving high reproductive success, all right, and the rest are giving lower reproductive success. Now, if we translate that idea of an adaptive landscape into our flower color, all right, so our genes controlling the variation in flower color along the horizontal axis, we've encountered those, the yellow and the magenta genes. The peaks, maybe, are the yellow and the magenta combinations that I've been talking about, each which has its own signpost and highlight. And the idea is that all the others, the other combinations fall in this area of low fitness, low, adap low adaptation. But that raises a problem, an evolutionary problem. If that's the case, that these hybrid combinations don't work very well, how did evolution ever get you from one peak to another peak? This is a general problem in evolutionary biology. If we're, say, magenta, how could we possibly ever evolve to become yellow? 
because we'd have to go down into a fitness valley, a valley of low fitness. And natural selection will never take you down into a low fitness valley because natural selection always increases fitness or favors an increase in fitness. So evolutionarily, you should be stuck on each peak. How can you possibly move from one peak to another? This is true not just of snapdragon flowers. It's true in general of whenever we think about adaptive optima, adaptive peaks. So how can we get our mind, our head around this. So let's first look at the thing, look at, let's look at the landscape from the top. All right, so I'm gonna look down on top of the landscape. And when we take a top view, all right, what you see are now these two sort of, um, two circles or two, two hot areas, as it were, which correspond to our peaks, our two bullseyes. So we have the yellow peak in one diagonal position and the magenta cloud peak in the other position and everything else has low fitness. Now, I already showed you some of the genetic combinations that should fall in these adaptive valleys, in these low areas, areas of low fitness. For example, there were white flowered ones that were in the, left, in the bottom left corner and the orange flowered ones in the bottom right corner. Now, if it's true that these represent uh, appearances or flowers with low fitness, low reproductive success, we shouldn't find any species with these flower color combinations, right? Because they, they shouldn't be very good at reproducing. So there are about 20 different snapdragon species. And um, if you look at them, here are some of them, you find that there are no orange flowered species. So that fits. And that kind of makes sense because bees are not very sensitive to the red orange end of the spectrum. And so, um, so orange flowers are not favored for bee pollinated flowers. So we don't find orange. But we do find white flowered ones. Okay, well quite, quite a few species have white flowers, and that doesn't seem to fit, or white backgrounds. That doesn't seem to fit with our idea. So we look at these species, and um, we find they each have very specific distributions. So what you can see on this map, the white areas correspond to where you will find species with these white flowers, white flowered backgrounds with these yellow and magenta highlights. So, but they grow in very specific conditions. And I'm going to show you one of those, a species called Antirhinum molly. This uh, species is growing on a cliff. Now, I don't know if any of you can see where that species, that plant is growing. So let me help you. It's growing there, all right, and in that red circle within the red. There's a plant growing there, clinging onto that cliff, spreading on that cliff. And if you zoom into that flower, what you see it has white flowers with a yellow highlight and a magenta highlight just over the bee entry point. It, you also see that the le it spreads out okay, over the cliff. That's because if you're uh, growing on a cliff, your main competition is actually rock. I mean, not, you're not even competing with other plants largely. You, the, the space is occupied by rock. So it pays to spread out and grow, grow, grow laterally rather than away from the rock. Now, this is different, for example, if you were to look at Antirhinum, the other species that I've been telling you about, Antirhinum pseudomagus and striatum, the magenta and purple ones. For example, if you look at the Antirhinum pseudomagus, this is where you will find Antirhinum pseudomagus. It tends to grow on slopes rather than on a cliff, hanging on a cliff. All right? And if you're growing on a slope, you, can, I mean, you may be able to see the purple spikes sticking up. All right? if, you're on a, if you're on a slope, you need to grow away from the competing plants around you and so you grow in erect fashion, all right? So you grow away, grow upwards. So maybe here's an explanation for why there's a difference. Maybe if you're growing on a rock, on a cliff, you're only illuminated from one side, all right? And so maybe being white is actually a, a, a striking um, color, all right? Because you're You've essentially only got light coming from one side, you're on essentially a dark background. But maybe if you're erect and growing up, you're growing on a slope, maybe being magenta or having magenta or yellow backgrounds is more striking in terms of distinguishing you from the surround. Now, if we take that idea uh, forwards, then we end up with two types of adaptive landscape. The landscape I just showed you earlier, in which the peaks, the high spots, are where we have magenta and yellow flowers. All right? But the, maybe that's where you're on a slope and growing with an erect habit. All right? There's another possibility, which is that maybe on a cliff where you're a spreading habit, maybe the optimum strategy there is to have white, white flowered background 
because that's maybe more striking. So when you're on a cliff with a spreading habit, the peak has shifted. It's at a different position. All right? So now we need to think, how do we relate these two slope, these two adaptive landscapes? How do we connect them and think about how they might be related? So to do that, I need to go into a higher dimension. All right? And to do that, I'm gonna, we're going to imagine now that the cliff... The, 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 the cliff and spreading habit are connected through, as an axis through the slope and direct habit. So what do I mean by that? So imagine we have an axis now that takes us from on the bottom end of the axis we have, we have cliff and spreading growth habits, whereas the top end we have a, you growing on a slope with an erect habit. And you can imagine intermediate cases which are sort of more slopey as you go from one to the other. So previously, we were working with uh, striatum and pseudomagus, the magenta and yellow. They were operating on the slope with the erect habit. So their landscape, their adapt we had two peaks located at the yellow and magenta positions. All right? But where if you're at a cliff uh, on, with a spreading habit, then the position is a different position. The peak is a different position. It's where the white flower is. So each of those adaptive landscapes I showed you before are like slices through a higher dimensional path, which has a sort of shape of a wishbone. All right? So you think about this, this region of red. All right? There's a region of high fitness. That's the shape of the region where you have high fitness. And the adaptive landscapes are slices through this connected path. All right, so we see that when we look at yellow, if we only look at the slice, we think that magenta and yellow are disconnected. But once we see in a higher dimension that they're connected through this, uh, through this wishbone, we can see that actually there is a path, a Latin evolutionary path where we don't go down in fitness that connects our magenta and yellow gene combinations. So how can we put this together? So imagine... The ancestor, let's suppose the ancestor was growing on a cliff, had white flowers, and had a spreading habit. Okay? So it grows quite happily in this environment, but every so often it throws off plants, seeds, that land on the slopes. Now most times these seeds don't do very well. All right? The plants don't do very well because they're adapted to growing on the cliff. They have this spreading habit. But occasionally there might be genetic combinations that manage to get a hold on the slopes. And I call these genetic pioneers. Okay? They, they have genetic combinations that allow them to get a hold and sort of eke out a living on the slopes. And then over generations, natural selection may start acting on these uh, individuals and these populations and will end up with them favoring an erect habit so that they now evolve with an erect habit because that's the habit that is better adapted on a slope environment. And as they develop an erect habit, now that shifts to where your best color is located. So rather than being white now, it maybe it pays to be either magenta or yellow. And a population could go either way. It, it has two options, two signposts it could go for. It could either go for the yellow with the magenta highlight or the magenta with the yellow highlight. Both are options. And maybe it's a matter of chance as to which population, whether a population goes one way or the other. But if you have different populations, some going one way, some going on another way, then you'll end up with these different distributions. And what happens when they come together, when they meet? Well, they will then start to exchange genes, unless they're so different that they can't exchange genes anymore. Let's just suppose that they're sufficiently closely related still that they can hybridize. They exchange their genes. Everything flows between them except for the genes for color, because they're the ones that only work in certain combinations and don't work well when you have these other combinations. So that's how you generate your genomic islands when these things uh, come together. So what, what general lessons do we draw from this? Okay. I think the first lesson that we draw from it is that evolution is not always about finding the solution, the optimum, Often there are multiple solutions, and this is illustrated by the fact we have multiple peaks. There isn't just one peak. There can be multiple solutions to an evolutionary problem, in this case signposting the flower. And moreover, to arrive at these different solutions, 
often involves what I call genetic pioneers, that is, that genotypes exploring environments that maybe are not initially ideally suited to that existence, but over time you can become adapted to it. So you have these genetic pioneers always exploring these solutions. And because you're dealing with a very high dimensional space of possibilities, a space in which involves the genes and the environment and the way they interact, then it's possible for these genetic pioneers to explore and arrive at multiple different solutions to the same problem. And it's important that it's the genes and the environment interacting here, because remember that if you're a spreading habit, and you have genes that give you a spreading habit, then that'll be good in one environment, but it might not be a good in another environment, say, on a, on a slope. So it's the combination of the genes and the environments, the high dimensional space that creates, and then evolution can take these paths that when we look at them today, we just look at them as slices, it seems everything's separate. But when we see them in this higher dimensional space, we see that actually everything's connected. Now I've given you an example of snapdragons. Why? Because because the snapdragons happen to be closely enough related, because we happen to be able to analyze the genes and dissect this process very carefully, genetically and in terms of the DNA sequence, and because they haven't diverged too much, we're able to pull out these general points and see that that's the sort of solution maybe to the conundrum of why we have these different flower colors in the wild. But that's a general, what I've said to you, the principles, although this is kind of like acting as a sort of genetic lens that's allowing us to see this in a very clear way, in the case of the snapdragon, the same principles may be applying to evolution in general. All right, so that when we, for example, see all these different forms and, 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 and species, they're all connected through the same principles of genetic pioneers operating through these high dimensional spaces, finding multiple solutions. And that's why we end up with more than one species in any, any given environment. Because actually there's many different solutions to surviving and reproducing in any environment. There isn't just one solution, there are many different ones. Each work well in their own different ways. They may have advantages in some ways, disadvantages in other ways, but they each can be good solutions to the problem. And these solutions have been arrived at over time, evolutionarily, through the sorts of processes that I've been describing, with pioneers establishing new ways and discovering new solutions. So what we see now is a whole bunch of species coexisting, displaying these different solutions to surviving and adapting. And it also means that evolution doesn't come to a standstill. Because even though we have a set of solutions, organisms are continually throwing off genetic pioneers, exploring new options, throwing up new possibilities, and so establishing new possible solutions to the problem of surviving and reproducing. And I think there's a sort of general take-home message from this, maybe even for us, which is that we're always looking for the optimum, the best solution, the optimal solution. But maybe what evolution is telling us that maybe is diversity and optimization are both very powerful ideas. And that, that sometimes there isn't a single optimal solution. Even though optimization is important, there can be many different solutions. And we have a diversity of solutions as well as this notion of optimization. Okay, so I've, that's the sort of uh, story I hope I'd like to share with you today. I've talked a lot about hybridization between plants, but also there's another type of hybridization that's been very important behind this story. That's a sort of hybridization of ideas and approaches. And everything I've told you really has depended on a series of collaborations involving four different institutions, ourselves at the John Innes Center in Norwich, um, we've collaborated with uh, Tamash Dalme's group with the University of East Anglia, particularly on the small RNA story that I talked about. We've collaborated with Yong Biao Xu at the, in Beijing, who uh, was very important in terms of the DNA sequence technology and analysis. And also we've collaborated with population geneticists Nick Barton and David Field in Austria, in Vienna. So it's really the integration of these different approaches. So, and we've all worked on these snapdragons. Okay? They haven't worked maybe for 33 years, but they've certainly worked for the last few years on this same problem to try and unravel this conundrum. And hopefully I've convinced you that through that we've arrived at some general insights.